Our, our speaker tonight is Doug Simpson. Um, Doug caught on his first skin-on-frame kayak when he was eight years old. He liked the sound of the wood creaking and seeing the water flowing as, his, as the craft glided silently through the water. After university, Doug worked in the Arctic prospecting for minerals and learned the importance of having a boat that could be folded up and taken in a small float plane. The idea of feather craft began. In 1977, Doug obtained patents on his designs and with his partner began producing kayaks in 1980 in a small shack on Granville Island in Vancouver. The company prospered and developed markets in Asia, Europe, and North America. Doug enjoyed paddling trips in many parts of the world, which led to the development of new models. So please welcome Doug Simpson. Thank you. Line. <laughs> Hello, thank you for having me here. Um, this, fit, this picture here, obviously it's a sea otter, and um, we were paddling, can you hear me? Yes. I'm not, I'm not an experienced speaker, I'm a kayak designer. <laughs> but um, we were paddling north of um, Port Hardy on our way to Cape Caution, and um, I felt this weight on my paddle and here is this sea otter chewing on my paddle. And um, I was a little surprised, and I, I shook the, the otter off, and then the otter jumped on my kayak, and then over onto to Evan's kayak, my son over there, and on, onto Dan's, and then back and forth. He played with us for about an hour. He jumped on our shoulders, and he ran from one boat to the other and underneath, and it was quite extraordinary. And meanwhile, we were, we were heading north, and we eventually pulled in. Do you know Skull Cove? Some of you might have known. It's, uh, anyway, it's, it's just south of uh, Cape Caution. And we pulled in there, got out of our boats, and that was the last we ever saw them. So I'm going to, that was a good introduction. And basically, um, I don't have to do the beginning anymore. <laughs> now, how do I, oh yeah, there it is. So this is um, an early kayak, uh, probably my 1970. This is Kitts Beach because I'm uh, born and raised in Vancouver, and um, it kind of looks a little bit like that old yellow jobby there. Only it's uh, PVC hull, and and I've been working on it for a few years. Um, I started without any knowledge at all. Um, I got a BCom, and I thought I was going to be a, an airline pilot, and then I just became obsessed. I, as you had mentioned, I was initially uh, kayaking when I was eight in this skin-on frame, and I just I kind of fell in love with how quiet it was and how supple. It, it moves to the water differently than a rigid boat. It, it, it absorbs some of the sea. It's stable, and it's incredibly quiet. Um, the story is that um, when Eskimos, Inuit, first tried fiberglass boats, they said, oh, we can't hunt with these, they're too noisy. I, I have no idea if that's a true story, but it sounds right. So let's get on. I know that I have to flash through these. I've got a lot of slides, and I've, I've got 50 years in 50 minutes. So we had a small shop. This is actually the second shop. The first shop I had on Granville Island was in the Granville Island Hotel. And I was a squatter there for about eight months before they even found me. And then uh, old Scotty, he came in, uh, he was the property manager, and he said, well, who the hell are you? And he marched me down to the office and he signed me up. And at the time we were making uh, greenhouses and I was designing the boats. And um, then we moved to this shop, which is, is now is used as a jewelry place. And it, the inside dimensions were 19 foot 5. And our first double was 19 foot 3. <laughs> and in order to turn it around, we had to take it out of the shop and put it back in. There was no heat in this shop. I had a little airtight heater, and we burned uh, wood from construction destruction. Ah, the first double. Not a good boat. <laughs> That was one of my failures. There's quite a few of them, actually. And um, so that boat in the yellow there, that was a, an early K1. And I just took a bow section from 
and a stern section, only bigger tubing and a little wider. And I joined them with a few bars in the middle there. You know, I find myself waving at the screen here, and it's not helpful to you. I should be waving up there. <laughs> anyway, those bars in the middle, they just were sort of like shock absorber, and the boat was a bit like a, um, a loose uh, spaghetti on the water. It was um, not a great success. So this is, um, this is an improved double, and that's my son. And um, I guess he's two, and we're paddling out of Bella Bella, and, um, which we did quite a bit of, quite a few trips. I, I, the Central Coast is, is just one of my absolute favorite places. And the next slide, if I can find it. So that's Evan again. Uh, he's older, and this is the, uh, I first went to um, Egg Island. Do you know where that is? It's in the Queen Charlotte Sound between Cape Caution and uh, uh, Calvert Island. So mid-coast, and it's a, um, it's a lighthouse. And um, I first was there in 1985, and this would be, I don't know, five years ago? Uh, no longer. Anyway, about 40 years later, and the reason this is important to me is because it encapsulates kind of the time I've spent on the water. And during that time, I've had some wonderful adventures, but I've also, and I will talk about this, I've also watched a lot of degradation of the ocean, uh, the pollution, the, the plastics, and I've, I've managed to paddle around in many places in the world, and, and I've seen a lot of changes. And during that time, when we first came here, these stairs were brand new. And now, 40 years later, they're falling down. So this encapsulates um, my time on the water. We still had fun. This is uh, Burnett Bay. And um, I don't want to fool you. I'm not a good juggler. Evan's way better than I am. But uh, we had a lot of fun on that trip, coming down Bella Bella, down to Hardy. Okay, I'm going to now, I'm going to slide, show you a bunch of places that I've been. And the, one of the reasons is that, um, well, we made the boats to go on trips, but also with the trips that we, that we made, there were huge improvements made on the boats because we found about them. We were in some sometimes pretty interesting waters. And um, this is how they, this is how they sort of generated into it and improved models. And um, we're in um, Russia here, uh, Bering Strait. The, the the idea was to cross the Bering Strait um, back to Homer from from Providenia, which is on the east uh, side of uh, the west side of the Bering Strait. Um, we had permission before we left, but we didn't. Uh, when we got there, we didn't have permission. And I, uh, I was paddling with um, Tom on the left, and his um, nickname was Balls to the Wall, and Louise on the right, whom I'd never met. They ordered a couple of doubles from us, and somebody dropped out, so I said, well, well I'll come. And Gennady is, is our, um, he's our guide. He's a Russian. And the thing about Gennady was interesting because he had never kayaked before, and he'd never been there either. But he was a terrific guide, as it turned out, because he spoke English, and he was terrific at making fires. So this is rescuing Gennady. And he's in, a, in a, an old British boat that had been left behind. And in the background there, there's, there's, uh, there's you know, this ice. And um, he was getting drawn underneath the ice pans. And the other person on the trip is Dick. You can see him there with the red hat. And I always thought of him as a Renaissance man. Um, these guys were from Boston. Um, and they, um, they were racers. They weren't real ocean paddlers. But when Tom came into the room, you realize this guy, he lifts weights. He was muscular. And, um, and he looked at me up and down, kind of like men often look at women, and I think he found me wanting. 
skinny guy. But I already had a bunch of experience on the ocean, so it actually turned out to be a pretty good team. What I didn't realize until further on the trip was that Louise and Tom had been an item, and now they were not. And it made for a pretty tense trip, actually. So we'll carry on. So we met these people that we were coming down the coast, and the, the guy in the middle, uh, Alexander, he invited us in because there was a storm coming. He said, you're going to be here for three days. And uh, they, he put us up in this little tiny shed, which they haul over the tundra for the reindeer herders in the Chukchi Peninsula. And, um, and they're, notice that they're leaning on something white. That's a polar bear skin that uh, he had shot the polar bear the winter before. They lived, lived full lives. The woman on, on your left, she had just come back from Homer and some of the places in Alaska, and they were, they were doing language research. And Alexander counts whales as they go by the Bering Strait. And although we were trying to cross the strait, we never got across. We, there was a, a special day when it was clear, and there's two big, two islands in the middle of Bering Strait. One is the Big Diomede, and the Russians call it Ratmanov, and the other is Little Diomede. There's only two miles difference between those islands. And then it's 25 miles to each island from either Russia or from the States. And we could see the Big Diomede one day. And there was a discussion, should we go? Can we run that far? Can we you know, get away from the Russians? And we had a vote. And fortunately, we decided not to go because we got buzzed by a military a helicopter an hour later. You can't outrun a helicopter in a kayak. So we've got a whale on the beach, and this is the last slide on, on this one. I'm gonna, gonna go somewhere else after this. But we were coming in, and it was the sun in our eyes, and there seemed like there was just a fuzzy rock. And we got in closer, and there was a, a Kodiak bear asleep on a whale, and it had eaten out the middle of that whale. And we rounded onto the beach, and then the bear stood up on the whale. He was, he was enormous, and he roared at us. And we backpedaled as fast as we could. And he could, have, he could have taken our heads off if he had wanted to, but you can tell that that didn't happen. And then he, he ran away. So we're going to go somewhere else now. And there's no penguins in the Bering Strait. Um, this is on uh, Cabot Ono, and uh, Balls to the Wall and, and, and um, Dick, and then a friend of mine, we, we paddled around Cape Horn, and um, it was a trip where we actually succeeded. We actually did it, which is like half of my trips. <laughs> and um, I was pretty interested in these. We got. We got to Cape Horn uh, after some, well, we were five weeks on this trip. And um, we landed on the island and we got stuck there for days because of the weather. And we got to look at these guys quite a lot. Uh, it was pretty rough. This is actually going around Cape Horn. That's uh, Dick and, and Tom. And we had a great day for that. And then we had a, uh, weeks getting back. Cape Horn. I, I can remember one, one event. We had to, this crossing, it wasn't too far, it was 16 miles, nautical miles, and we waited for a few days until the weather was reasonable, and we did the crossing. And Tom, who was always in a hurry, um, got mad at, at, at uh, my partner because he was chewing on a chocolate bar instead of paddling. And um, so Jerry said, well, I'm not I'm not choking on no, my, my chocolate bar for nothing. He used a stronger language than that. And Tom said, no, I said, oh, these boats, kind of boasting, these boats can cross, cross the ocean. And, and Tom said, I don't want to cross the ocean. But the interesting thing about that is a few years later, he rode uh, a rowboat across the Atlantic. <laughs> Changed his mind. 
So, we lost it. So this is a, um, obviously a drawing of a Greenland, Greenland style kayak. The, the Greenland kayak has five ribs. The, the Bering Strait, uh, the Bering Sea kayaks had seven, 11. They were built in a heavier way. Um, I realized when I started to design the kayaks that we only needed five bars. I already had a little knowledge on airplane construction because I was a pilot and I knew that five bars would be enough. And so this boat here, this is called the Catsalano, and it, it has the five bar structure. And it's actually modeled after a Greenland uh, drawing such as this. I, I did the drawing, um, I expanded it a bit and tried the boat, didn't work, and made some modifications. So if you look at that, and then you look at this, you'll see a whole lot of similarity. Different, different technique of construction, but it's really that the lines are there. And, and I love those lines. I didn't start off with this shape because I didn't think I, I knew enough. But after making boats for about a decade, I, I figured it was time to make a Greenland boat. So that's with my, my, my pal, Eric who was a, a raging hippie. <laughs> this is in Upernavik. And for me, this is like going to Mecca. This is, this is like, wow, Greenland kayaks. And in Upernavik, there's this little tiny museum with these, these boats. And um, I spent a lot of time just gazing. Meeting up with people that's coming down the coast. I had paddled the east side of Greenland uh, a few years before, but this this was this was different because on the east side we didn't meet anybody, but on the west side we did. This guy's he's skinning a, a kayak. Out of Umanak, people playing. That's me playing. No. Uh, I used to roll a kayak, I was actually, you know, I could do a bunch of rolls and hand rolls, and um, not anymore, too sore. I, I did some rolls a couple of years ago and I couldn't stand straight for days. So those days are gone. We spent a lot of our time just hiking. Uh, the, the glaciers come right down into the ocean. It was, this is some of the most spectacular scenery that, that, that I could ever dream of seeing. We, um, that's not a wolf, that's a sled dog. We, we camped on this island and thinking, well, this is a great place. But um, it turned out it was a penal colony for, for, uh, for sled dogs. And um, we didn't have anywhere to hang our food. Like, what do you do with your food when there's all these hungry dogs around? We, we sort of slept with our food in our little tents. And um, tents, 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 yeah. But it all worked out. Um, this, is the, this is right on top of the um, Greenland ice cap. And Volkswagen built a road from the air, main airport, Kangalooswak, 25 miles up to the ice pack. And I, I wanted to see that. So we left most of our gear and hiked the 25 miles. And um, we got up here and, and it rained and it rained on, on ice with pooled water, and it was probably, we didn't have all our gear, it was probably the coldest night I've ever had. I was expecting this, you know, beautiful sunshine and, and um, pristine white. This is not what we got. So this is a new trip. Um, I got into sailing, kind of in a big way, and although this is in Haida Gwaii, and I'd been there before, and we, we, we sailed the, the, the Moresby Island, and we were testing out, these are catamarans, and um, the joint, and that's uh, Ken Fink. And there's four sails, or four sails in a, in a hammock for sleeping. And so there's two people in each catamaran. And our, we wanted to go um, to the uh, French Polynesia, and sail from the uh, 
uh, down, down to Tahiti from the Seychelles. These are the best dancers. We were in um, Faruhiva, and we had paddled there from Hiva Oa, uh, an overnight paddle um, up, upwind. T took us a whole day, just a whole night and day for 60 miles. And um, it was a fabulous place. We set off from Faduhiva, and it was a 300 mile crossing to Hiva Huka Huka. I don't remember the name of that place, but it was one of the atolls, Hiva Hiva. But a huge storm came up, and um, it was just enormous and in the middle of the night. And um, Evan was steering, and I was trying to sleep. And he said, oh, you can't handle it anymore. And the sails were up, so I, I was trying to take all the sails and, and tie them up. And a rope uh, wrapped around my, my little finger and tore it to the bone. And then um, it infected. And then I got sepsis. And, um, and then uh, one of the boats sank as well. Um, when, when the other boat came up uh, to us, uh, Dan, the other guy, said, uh, how are you doing? And all Evan could say was, my dad won't put his pants on. And that was because I found it warmer uh, without my soaking wet uh, shorts on. Um, so there were then now, with one sink, sinking, um, there were four of us on one catamaran built for two. Uh, and we were still 85 miles from our nearest destination, and I had um, was really sick. I was hallucinating by then, and um, we had a sat phone. And um, so, what do you do when you have a sat phone? You're in trouble. Well, you call your wife, of course, <laughs> poor thing. So I called the gendarmes, but they wanted they wanted me to be on. Um, in contact with them 24-7. We didn't have the battery, and there was an accent problem. So I, I called my wife, and she, she would talk with the gendarmes. She was on a landline. And um, we arranged, finally, someone came by two days later and picked us up. Um, we were able to locate, uh, you know, indicate our position. And then when they got within a few miles on our VHF radio, they were able to um, find us. It was a wonderful thing when the Vinnie Vinnie 7 came into view. That's the boat, uh, that's our boat getting dragged up and um, Captain, the, Captain Bruno, he took everything. He took the boats, he took all our instruments. I mean, this is payment for being picked up because this is a tuna boat and they, um, they for, for went a lot of uh, money. Uh, in terms of lost catch to pick us up because they had spent an extra day, I guess, coming to get us. So that's Dan and Captain Bruno. Notice the cell phone uh, on, on his neck. We're hundreds of miles from the nearest cell phone. And the other thing that he's got on his neck is uh, Black Pearl. He's a very rich man. He has, uh, in the, uh, the atolls, the Tuamoto atolls, there's a lot of Black Pearl farming. And um, it's, uh, it's quite lucrative. That's the end of the trip. And there's my um, bandaged hand. And Dan, I should introduce Dan. Dan came into our, our lives. Single mom came into our lives when he was about 11. And he's been a, you know, a close friend, kind of like a son ever since and a big brother for Evan. So this is, um, I still got into the sailing thing, but that was, that boat was a disaster, you know? And I, the only um, solace I have is even, even, you know, Elon Musk is still blowing up his rockets. So you gotta have failures. You know, if you're going to make stuff, you've got to have feelings. And, and, and a bit of, yeah, I guess hubris, I guess. 
So this is a new sailing rig, and we're in the um, just the Florida Keys, and we're just going to paddle 100 miles from Key West, Key Key Largo to Key West. Very shallow, and it was a wonderful paddle. Um, but um, during that paddle, we we broke a mast, and the amazing thing about this was. We broke it in the afternoon, and the next morning we had, a, you know, good old uh, FedEx. We had a new mast from Feathercraft, which is extraordinary, you know. So the next trip, I promised the guys, okay, the last one was a bit of, you know, <laughs> wasn't the greatest. So we're going to have an easier trip, and it's going to be a sailing trip. So um, does this point work as a pointer? Oh, yeah, it does. This is... Um, Long Island, and this is the Jumentos down down to uh, there. This is Cuba, and then the Exumas are this chain that run all the way up here, and then across there's Nassau. And I, seven years earlier, I had paddled the Jumentos with a friend Willie, and it was fantastic. Um, it was very dry. We had a a uh, hand desalinator, but um, the, the, this, you know, the, the, the diving was great. We fed ourselves with um, spear fishing, just a, just a you know, Hawaiian sling, and um, there was still coral. But so we, we, we sailed this, and it was, it was a glorious sail, and the trade winds come from this direction, so, and in summer, so it was hot, but we had the trades. But um, 90% of the coral is now dead. And that seven years is just devastating for that area. They just had too many bleachings. The sailing was fantastic. Here's um, Dan and Evan landing on Sandy Key, which was just like, wow, what a place. Um, just open sand, beautiful skin diving iguanas and we could really tear along so this is the new sail rig and you can see here there's there's a, this is called an aka a cross crossbar and the ama is the float on either side and then this is a bat sail uh, that i'd had designed for us i didn't design the sail um, and we were, we could tool along seven eight knots uh, doing doing this, a lot of fun. So here's one of our last beach, and you know the plastic. Um, there's way more plastic in Asia. This is not, but than than we have here. There's plastic everywhere, but this is uh, this beach is way the hell gone and you wouldn't have expected beach to be at the top end of the a hook of the exumas but it was i guess it was a hook and, and, and the, the, the the plastic just came there and there's no one there nobody on these keys to clean it up our last day on on the exumas and um we had rum on our trip, and this is drinking the final rum for the night. And Dan there, after he drank it, he got into the wrong tent. <laughs> I'm switching. So I was invited to Japan in the mid-'80s, and I, I was amazed. Um, they, they had... They did have folding kayaks, but they weren't very strong, and I was invited by Notasan, who's a very famous poet, and he had done a lot of his, his uh, boat travel in the, in the Yukon River in northern Canada. And um, so he invited me, and first of all, we were making river boats, but then we started making sea kayaks, and we sold and, and developed, we sold a lot of kayaks and developed a lot of beautiful friends. And this guy, here on the right is, is uh, Nakimura-san. And one of the reasons why the boats are popular, of course, is just their portability, because people would take them through the subways and buses and everything. 
They do a lot of public transport in, in Japan. That's Shige. He's um, always was a clown. And uh, that's my wife, Teresa, right there. She's at home with a brand new hip. I call her my hipster right now. And these women, you know, they were, they were very independent. You know, I think we have this generalized idea of the women in Japan, no, oh, no, they're just sort of housewives and things. They, a lot of these women came on their own in buses or in, in, in uh, transit and made, set up their own boats. They did their own thing. So we would have a symposium every year and um, a bunch of us would get together and then the dealers, uh, we would go on a trip. So I've been on a lot of trips in Japan. So this is, I'm gonna describe one trip. So up the north here, this is the southern main island of Kyushu and down here is Taiwan. And we decided to do this paddle, see if we could get to Taiwan. And the area here is the, the Jiyoku, that's the peoples who, who inhabited this, and they were um, Micronesians. And of course they were influenced by China, and they're also influenced by Japan. And for, for many, many centuries, they were independent, but, but kind of vassals of China as well. And the, the, the main uh, current, is called the Rogue Kuroshio, and it's called the, it's the Black Current, Kuroshio, and it's the second largest current other than the second to the, the Gulf Stream. And so, of course, it current runs from south to north, so we decided to go from north to south. And um, the only way to do that is with, with the, the prevailing winds going south to north most of the year, but just in, in October and then in the winter, they go from north to south. So we decided in September, October, we would head from north to south. But that does mean you're, you're going against the current. It also means you're going to get more waves because you've got current against, everybody knows that here, current against the wind. So I'm going to show you a couple of slides. But the main one I'm going to show you is this crossing here, which is 150 nautical miles from, uh, this is, um, Karama, and this is Okinawa and Naha, which is the capital of Okinawa, and Karama, and then Miyakojima. But there's a couple of shots I'll show you here. These are the guys. So on the, on the left there is, is Nakamura-san, and he's um, eating uh, probably Spam. Spam is really, really popular in Okinawa. It was introduced by the American uh, forces, armed forces, and they eat spam with rice and they eat spam in their rice balls and yeah, it's really important. And then next is one of my best friends, Shiro Ose-san, and um, then to the right of that is Hobo Jun. Oh, Nakamura-san, I should tell you about, oh, I think the next slide shows Nakamura-san. Yeah, that's at our shop on Gravel Island. and. He, 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 we made that sale, but it, he, he designed that sale. So here we have a Japanese version of a Chinese junk sale. We have a kayak inspired by Inuit, and then all this, the uh, cross uh, Akas and Amas are uh, Polynesian. So it's a great fusion of, of design, which really excited me. Um, on the trip, that's Dan and Shiro enjoying the local food. <laughs> Kaimanduk, Kaimandake uh, Mountain. I probably mispronounced that, but you'll never know. <laughs> so there we are, and, and these are the sales that Naki made. And Dan, he called Naki the Naki 5,000 paddling robot because Naki, he was small, but he never stopped paddling, never looked back. 
And during that time, Harry Potter was big, and, and there was the Nimbus 5000. So it was the Naki 5000. This is just a very short video. I found that the, the little jib up in the bow really helped with the steering, just not just the, um, the jump sail. I'm going back. Um, this is Evan again in the bow of that boat. This is a Klondike, which was a family double we made. And um, this is Karama. And when we went there, Evan and his little friend Jenny, um, it was an extraordinarily beautiful place for, for diving. The coral was brilliant. Um, the stacked coral, the, the fans, and you name it, it was, it was there. And then years later, we're setting off um, from Karama. This is the, the long crossing. And um, by then, there was no coral that was alive. There was a little bit, but hardly any. I, um, I left a light uh, back at the uh, camp. So we went back to it. And then Dan and Evan went ahead, landed on a beach. Dan's pretty rough with gear and they landed on a steep slope with uh, sharp coral and um, they punched a hole in the boat and didn't realize it and then we set off. And this is um, during the night with uh, Shiro. I was paddling with Shiro and um, it was okay as long as we were sailing. They could pump and sail at the same time. They soon realized that they were sinking and they had to keep pumping but then Ah, the, the wind stopped, and then we still had another 85 miles to go, and we had to paddle it. So they would paddle for about 20 minutes and then pump. And of course, when they stopped paddling, they went backwards because that was where the current was going. So it took us um, four days um, to get to Miyakojima. We were incredibly tired. And the only one who stayed awake the whole time was, was my son because I figured, I figured it was just because of all those all night video games he'd been doing all those years. And he's the only one who could stay awake the whole time. I must say that just before we got to Miyakujima, we, it was pitch black and there was a huge storm and there was lightning everywhere and the lightning hit and I looked around behind and there's, there's their boat and I thought they were gonna crash into us. And it, with the lightning, I, I can only just think about this aluminum rod between my legs. <laughs> this, um, and, it, and um, you know, it's just a lightning rod. So fortunately, everything worked out okay. And this is the next morning. One of the beauties of this uh, sail is that um, you can reef it to all those different places. T in a totally reefable sail. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful rig. We started with um, comparing it with our own bat wing sail, and it was actually faster. Okay, this is Miyakujima, and ta the area is known as Typhoon Alley, and they get typhoons all the time, and we never got. To, to Taiwan because we, we went back to Miyakujima and, and there was this, um, there was a, a uh, category four typhoon. And we were there for days just waiting to leave. And there were three women there, one of, they're holding on to Evan, probably so they won't get blown away. And uh, they were interesting. Uh, two of them were prostitutes and they, 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 um, they live on an island which is known by men as a place to come for that service. They were there for the diving. Don't worry, there was no hanky-panky with us. This is after the typhoon. That's the uh, 
Sugar cane ruined. We went on to Tarama Island, Taramashima, and this is after the the typhoon and all this stuff was brought in, and and there were bottles everywhere and uh, and trash, and Shiro was just trying to figure out where it all came from. A lot of it was from China, and some of it was from Vietnam, and there's some from Japan, all over the place. This is just a reminder, this is what, this is right here. And um, I'm just putting stuff away, um, Darcy Island. So, the next topic is <laughs> the tar sands. And um, as you know, it's just getting um, filled up now, when they just opened up the new pipeline. And I, this is my one attempt at being an activist, and I made a giant slug that eight people could um, inflate and um, float as a sort of a protest. And there I am, and we're at a, um, right across the way is the Burnaby Refinery, and we're at Kate's Park on North Van. And I, I joined the protest, and it didn't work out as much as I hoped because there was a bit of a breeze and, and it was like the tail wagging the dog and I could hardly control this thing. It mostly just um, got in people's way. But it was an attempt. Uh, a few years later, Evan and I decided to paddle from that same refinery, Burnery, down to Victoria and we, we left St. Kate's Park and went into the, into the uh, harbor, which we're not supposed to do. And uh, we got picked up by this uh, port authority. Notice the, the name, this, I don't know if you can read it, Stakaya, just like our, our wolf on the Discovery Island. And they, they picked us up. And um, fortunately, they were really nice, and they took us to um, Stanley Park, so they, they got us through. Um, meanwhile, we were getting a lecture on how we shouldn't be there. And Evan, who works for the Coast Guard, was just sort of trying to be very humble. And they didn't want them to know <laughs> that he works for the Coast Guard. <laughs> so this is um, Robert's Bank. And um, you know, the, the Great Pacific Flyway is, is, is an important bird area so that the birds Thousands and thousands of them come and they land in this area, Sturgeon Bank and, and, and Roberts Bank and, and um, areas around there. And there's a, um, a film that, with, with the Carrick's grass here and, and the mud, and the fresh water and the sea water, it all joins together. And it, it, it's, it's nutritious for, for especially sandpipers. It's called biofilm. And without that, they can't, they can't fly on. So this is an incredibly important ecological area. And it's right, right there off uh, Richmond and Vancouver. And quite extraordinary, and Sea Island. Um, because they're dredging the Fraser every year, this, the, the dredging that the normally would come around and refurbish, refurbish all this area, regenerate it, is being lost. So those wetlands are they're, they're diminishing every year. Change of topic. Um, this is the current, which is our smallest single kayak, and much smaller than any of these. And Shiro wanted to meet a special friend. So this is on Vargas Island near here. And that's uh, John Dowd. Maybe some of you know John Dowd or who he is. Um, he wrote a book on sea kayaking back in the 70s. And um, that was sort of, and he started Eco Marine. Um, that was sort of like really the onset of the surge in popularity in, in kayaking. And instead of kayak, this is, this is what he drives now. <laughs> And it, it looks like James Bond. 
So those wheels just come down, he wheels it up. So he was living in, um, on Vargas Island for years um, in a caretaking house, a gorgeous place. And he's written a book, it's available now, about their time on the island. And that's George and, and uh, Shiro and, and, and B on Vargas. So here, this is a, an airboat. Um, I, I decided, uh, sort of learning the language of air, we, um, I didn't think that there were very good paddling inflatable boats, not, not as far as handling. So I just wondered if, if, if um, we could do that. Not, I, I, I'm afraid my, my concern is always whether it can be done rather than whether it can be sold. But um, anyway, I came up with this boat after three years of searching, of researching, and it works quite well. So this is a, a, a short trip we did from Victoria to Nanaimo uh, in, in February. And it was, of course, wet. So I made a bunch of other boats. We, we, um, we made this pontoon fishing boat, and that's Bailey, best dog in the world. I, I'm not an expert fly fisher, but I, I go with people who are, so I'm al always successful. <laughs> that's Bailey on, we actually made a surf ski. And we made some rowboats and pack boats for river travel as well. And Martin, he always wanted to go, as he would say, go rip some lips. So we're up on um, Garibaldi Lake here. And this is definitely catch and eat. That's off the brooks quite recently, a couple of years ago. So I, I've just described how much fun it's been and actually, you know, life-changing for me to go to Japan. This is uh, Shanghai. And we had a couple of dealers in China for a while. And the first thing that happened was that they tried to steal our name. And um, the people were fine, but um, <laughs> the, um, the just different rules there. So this is a... Um, copy of a K light and um, it's an exact copy uh, there's a uh, an assembly video online and I was amazed they they hadn't changed anything um, and I was I became aware of that somebody sent me this and um, then I got an email from a guy who said gee I'd like to design I'd like to make a boat a copy of yours and turned out he already had, but um, he says, is that okay? And I, well, you know, I just, I consider myself um, a student of skin kayaks. And, you know, they started 4,500 years ago. I don't, I don't own the design, you know. I, I, I said, yeah, go ahead. Um, don't call it a feather craft, of course. Now, during all this time for the last 15 years, I've, I've, I've been writing about ocean matters and also my trips online. And it's called, it's at, um, you can see it if you go to feathercraft.com. It's book length, you're not gonna get through it, but in a day, but in, you know, in an hour or something, but that writing is there. And um, there's also inter interlaced with the chapters on trips, there's chapters on ocean health, acidification, sea level rise, warming temperatures, whatever. And it, the, the actual site is called oceanacidificationreview.org, but you can link to it from feathercraft.com. And so I told him, well, why don't you just translate this into Mandarin, thinking that he wouldn't. And um, well, he said he would. And suddenly our website suddenly got really active. So, and he sent me a, an English translation of a Mandarin translation of what I was writing. And I, it's, I wrote that. 
I should tell you that, um, you know, there's, there's Nolan here from Track Kayak, so if you want a skin boat, I would think that you should maybe talk to Nolan at, at Track Kayaks. They make a, a good skin kayak rather than go to this, um, that site. So this was a, this was a um, shock. I didn't know anyone was paying attention, but in 2010 I got a so-called Lifetime Achievement Award for Design. And um, I was very surprised, but also wondered, is that all there is? Is this my life? <laughs> um, there were a couple of designs after that, but um, yeah, it was amazing. So this is during the presentation. That's our ex-premier there, Campbell. Okay, so now um, I'm, I'm into some of the things that I'm interested in right now. And um, that's my wife, the, the hipster. And um, about four years ago, um, Jim Shortreed and I started a group for trying to re rejuvenate herring in the Victoria area. And I had been aware of what they were doing with hanging nets off docks and floats in House Sound and Fultz Creek. And I wondered if we could do it here. So I made about 70 of these nets and we hung them. This was in 2019, right at the beginning of the pandemic. And Jim went away for work. So that left Dries and I without um, having to clean these nets every other day um, for a couple of months. And she did it, and then she said after that, she's not playing anymore with that game. <laughs> and that's me uh, looking at someone. We made this line of um, sit on top, self bailing kayaks as well. But the main squeeze here is these nets. And we haven't succeeded in any spawns in the Victoria Harbor yet. But Jim has gone on to start a, a, a group um, and the idea is trying to declare a moratorium on herring fishing. It's hard because the uh, powers that be are the commercial fishers and they have, they want their quarterly profit. So this is Jim. He doesn't look so goofy when he's not um, salivating over herring spawn, but a couple of years ago there was a small spawn off the Squamalt Lagoon. And this is the other really important guy here, Yogi Karasfeld, and he, of, of anyone who's, who's interested in, 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 in rejuvenating the water in the gorge and around here, uh, Yogi is the guy. And he's a marine biologist, and he wrote his, amazingly, his PhD in herring spawn, and, um, and, and he, he tells me that, you know, he doesn't know where the herring are gonna spawn. You know, it's, it's up to the herring. So what they're doing is they're, this is this year, there was a small herring spawn just off Fiskart, and he's putting out some branches for, um, for the songies. You can see the color there of the spawn, this is sperm. There, they, there it is. They're out there, um, he and his friend Bruce, catching uh, a few herrings uh, for samples for his lab. So he's the founder of World Fisheries Trust, and they do all sorts of good research about fisheries. Um, I got a chance to do some of the fishing that day, and you just put the line in. I didn't realize um, that spawning herring would be so hungry, but there was no time. They just took the hook right away. So this is, um, UVic did a satellite view with filters. They, this is the, how small that little herring spawn is. But we realized, like in the future, this is a good way to find some of the herring spawns. Very cool. And this was a recent symposium, and Jim's uh, new group is the Herring Conservation and Restoration Society. And um, like I said, there's the idea is if, if there's only, there used to be five big herring spawns on the coast. Remember that the herring, 80% of Chinook salmon's food is herring. 
and 80 percent of the the local migrant uh, the local killer whales the orcas is the chinook so this is a foundation fish and our, our whole coast depends on the herring and yet there's only one herring spawn left on off Hornby Island and there used to be five and the one off Haida Gwaii hasn't been fished for 20 years and it still hasn't come back because a new equilibrium has formed and there just don't seem to be any increase. So it's really important. So our idea is if you declare a moratorium and you don't fish that one last herring spawn, some of them are liable to migrate and start new areas. There used to be herring everywhere on our, on our um, coast. I'm going to change the subject now to the, my last topic, close to the heart. So my family's had a, a little cabin on Pender Island for about 58 years. And um, so I've been going there, and it's fabulous because I can paddle there in the winter and um, I can heat up. It's lovely. So right there, uh, let's get this pointer right. So that's where I want to establish the sea farm. And the sea farm is to be composed of um, sugar kelp and scallops. And um, you gotta wonder, why isn't it being done already? So if you look at this little table and compare different, different proteins, um, in terms of CO2, the amount of water, the land area, and the conversion ratio, just look at where shellfish are. Um, in terms of CO2, and there's, there's zero water, um, four compared to 500 in terms of CO2 equivalents. So that's why shellfish are an amazing protein and sustainable. This is a photo by um, Chris Hadfield and it shows after the atmospheric river that took place in what 2021 where all the sediment went and if you see the the Gulf Islands they're still blue. Now scallops they will die in, in any kind of fresh water or any kind of silt so here, here you have it. It's an absolutely perfect place to be growing scallops and seaweed and the market. Hey, Victoria, the whole lower mainland. So I pitched it first. Um, Jim went with the herring uh, proposal and I went with, um, with a whole bunch of nice diagrams, that you've, one of which you've seen. And this is uh, Chrissy Shen and she's the fisheries manager for the sale First Nations up near Sydney. And, um, you know, we kind of thought she'd just throw us out of the office, but she was actually really receptive to what we had to say. And um, this is a uh, map of the Gulf Islands. These, the sales are the original inhabitants of the southern Gulf Islands. And um, Sayas Des is, is, is Pender Island. So they're, they're interested, and we've, we've gone on to the site in their boat, check it out. They kind of like that. So this is a poster we made. And um, the, the Southern Gulf Islands Communities and Resource Center is, is an overall group that handles social uh, housing, um, you know, recreation, and for the Southern Gulf Islands. And they're on board with this, um, this idea, which, um, which, is, which is quite wonderful. This just shows a little bit more of how, how such a sea farm works. The idea of the seaweed and, and the shellfish together is that they, they, they nourish each other. So the, um, the ocean brings all the nutrients to such a, such a farm. There's no inputs from, from, from us. And the, um, 
the seaweed provides oxygen and nutrients for the shellfish, for the scallops, and the scallops filters the water, leaves it cleaner than it was before they're there. So I, I feel that um, that's sort of like a lot of my paddling has led up to this project to get the sea farm started. And this is, um, it's not a brilliant photograph, it's uh, this morning at um, Trial Island. Because I, I still paddle three days a week and um, I like to get out there. There's a couple of, you know, that's a seal and that's a seal. You've seen lots of seals. But I, I, like, I like going backwards, and they didn't accommodate me this time. They usually pop up. They like to follow you, so if you paddle backwards, they come right up to your bow. But um, they, they, they didn't cooperate this morning. And that's the sea otter again. My wife is a painter, and that's her version of that first one that you saw. And that's it. Thank you very much. You. If anybody has any questions. Sure. Did you have any plan for repairing the hole in the boat while you were underway? No. <laughs> but I, I could do it now. <laughs> Yeah, we, we, um, that's a really good question. And when, I, when I got home, the first thing I did was work out a system that repairs boats, uh, even when they're underwater. And yeah, I got a system, but <laughs> we didn't have one then. <laughs> yeah? There, there, we were paddling around James Island today, that area. There's a sea um, farm there. Yes, there is. That's a sale farm, farm also. When I started talking with Chrissy, um, that wasn't there, but it was in planning. And that's Cascadia, and they're running that farm in cooperation and with um, sale, First Nation. Yeah. And so this has been there two years now. That's, that's the kind of thing you'd be interested in? Yes. Yeah, only they're just doing uh, sugar kelp and maybe mal uh, alaria, which is uh, wing kelp. Um, they're, not, they're not interested in the shellfish. Shellfish is, I'm, I'm more interested in the shellfish. I see the seaweed is, is, is helping the shellfish. Especially with, it, uh, at now it's not so bad, but with the ocean acidification increasing, every year, the, the shells will, will become much, shellfish will become much uh, less prolific. They're already becoming that. And the, um, the, the seaweed buffers against that by providing more oxygen for the shellfish. Mm -hmm. Probably, I've never, it's never bothered me because when I'm paddling my, I guess I'm, I'm bending my legs so they're not just flat on the water. Yeah, I don't know if it's much difference in that respect, but one thing I will tell you is that it, it, it feels way more subtle than in a rigid boat. Um, it's a gentle feel and it's also more stable. Sorry? Did they have antibiotics for you when you had your... Uh, yeah, we had, we had um, some antibiotics that I had saved from, from, from my dentist, from, from not using them for my dentist. And that was, that was enough to get me through. And then they got us to Hiva Oa, which is where we started. And they fed me with some really strong antibiotics. And he didn't think I'd keep my finger because... And my arm was red, too. Um, but... Um, he, but I've, I've still got my fingers bent, but it works, and I'm very happy to have it. <laughs> yeah. Over there? Uh, what kind of uh, scallops are you farming? Are they sort of local scallops? No, there, there's a combination. There, there's, there's, um, 
It's a combination with Japanese scallops, because the local, local scallops are tiny, and whereas the Yesip scallop, we also call the Japanese scallop, but it's called it, the ones that we, we would be growing would be called the giant Pacific scallop. And remember, right now, the uh, scallops that you buy are either from the east coast of Canada or most of them from Peru. And of course, they're not in the shell. Um, so these would, uh, we want to raise them in the shell. There's, there's, a, there's a market for them, but there's no, no supply. What's the potential then to turn it into some or other species like the Japanese clam that is dominated the local clam? Yeah, I, we've, we've, we've researched that. and. The the scallop population is isn't such that it would really interfere with it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Doug. And Doug, hold on. We're gonna, you're going to get presented with the much sought after Siska mug. Oh my goodness. Thank you very much. Thank you. Much sought after. Much sought after. Rarely seen. Um, so next, this is our last meeting for the summer. The next meeting will be in September, and you won't want to miss it. It's um, Dr. Popsicle from University of Manitoba, is it? Who talks about um, hypothermia. And I've seen his presentation recently on Scott BC, and it's really, really interesting. So he's going to be doing a workshop, I think Thursday, Friday, what day is this? Wednesday. Thursday, Friday night, and he's coming here on the Wednesday night. So watch for that workshop, too. Um, it'll be advertised soon. Not through us, but through somebody. <laughs> and Gretel's put the information on in the newsletter. Okay. So that's it for tonight, I think. BJ? Okay. Have a good summer.